This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Now, I would like to turn it over to the fabulous and lovely Greg, the intern with Paul.com, who is also a security engineer for a financial services firm. Greg specializes in vulnerability management, penetration testing, and security architecture. He's on tonight to cover his world-renowned, infamous blog post titled Windows Software Restriction Policies. There is a link into the show no- in the show notes to the full blog post. Take it away, Greg. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh, so this was kind of a, um, an idea that, that uh, Mr. Strand had come up with uh, about looking at software restriction policy, and I, I didn't, honestly didn't really know that much about it. Uh, and when I started taking a look at it, I realized that this actually could work very, very well for a lot of organizations. Um, so in what I do, I do a lot of incident response type things uh, along with many other uh, areas. And one of the biggest things we see is just this, this uh, constant stream of drive-by um, malware that hits machines. And so when you look at software restriction policy, I know we, you call it uh, uh, world famous. We did get a little uh, publicity from, uh, from Dave Kennedy because I used set in, in the demo. And... Uh, really, the point was that you can bypass anything, and, and Dave pointed that out. And he, he posted a nice little script to show me <laughs> how easily you could bypass SRP, which is great. But uh, for, for most of what we see, uh, it's, it's drive-by stuff that, that you know, it's kind of unattended on the other end. So if we could stop you know, kind of 80% of the noise that we see, uh, then, you know, we're going to be a lot better off. We can really focus on the stuff that, that uh, not necessarily the stuff that matters because everything matters, but the stuff that, that we think is going to really do actual harm. Mm, that's great. Uh, yeah. So, so a software restriction policy, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's actually been in Windows since uh, XP, uh, which is cool. And they've, they've kind of expanded a little bit, and it sounds like uh, they used it as the basis for AppLocker, um, which is kind of the, the push forward. But SRP is very simple compared to AppLocker. So with, with SRP, you can kind of define um, different ways to do, uh, to do um, restrictions. AppLocker looks at the application. With SRP, you can do it based off of a certificate, which that's kind of uh, deprecated from what I'm hearing. Or they're, they're working on kind of taking that out of there um, and use like trusted zones. Um, you could do it off of just a hash of an executable. You can also just the the basic way, which is the easiest way, which is the way I I did in the uh, text minute, uh, the blog post I did earlier was off of the path, and with that, what I saw was you could you could stop an attacker from or you could stop somebody from running thing in, in their profile directory. So Java uh, drive bys those wouldn't run because you can't run anything out of your your profile. Uh, so you could just force it to run out of um, you know program files or. Uh, the Windows System 32 directory, places where you wanted, you know, where executables should be running and not running out of your home directory. Uh, so those are kind of the ways you can do it. Um, there was a few caveats that I found as I was going through this. Uh, the first one was uh, links. So by default, SRP defines a link or uh, uh, a shortcut as an executable. So I had a lot of problems getting it to work properly uh, because shortcuts on my desktop wouldn't run and I couldn't figure out why and I fought and fought and fought and then I realized that links were, were put in there so when I disabled anything out of my profile a, a symbolic link or a shortcut wouldn't run so if you remove uh, shortcuts then you know things out of your start bar things out of your, your launch menu things out of your desktop would run just fine um, and that seemed to be to, to be kind of the only problem there um, I also noticed that that 32 uh, bit systems uh, you know it by default SRP defines 32 uh, bit uh, system. So 64-bit systems, you had to add the program files directory for x86. Um, you also, uh, as Dave Kennedy pointed out, or uh, another individual I think pointed out, that that uh, PowerShell lives both in SysWow 64 and in uh, Windows System 32. So on a 64-bit system, I had to exclude both of those, otherwise PowerShell scripts would run. Uh, so if you did a set attack, either with... Um, PowerShell injection turned on or without it, but with PowerShell injection turned on, it worked just fine because by default, anything that lives in uh, uh, Windows NT current version system root, which is system 32, uh, it would actually run just fine. Uh, So I had to go in and add an extra exclusion uh, for the PowerShell executable. 
uh, to run as a basic user. Uh, so if you don't have a lot of options with it. It's, it's really you run uh, programs are disallowed. Programs are allowed as a basic user, which I haven't really found out the, def the de definition of a basic user other than non-administrator. Uh, or you can run any uh, unrestricted. So those are kind of your base settings. So I just set everything uh, at the security levels to disallowed. And then in, in your additional rules inside of your uh, group policy for uh, software restriction policy, I set everything, uh, I set everything individually to allowed. Um, and then, and then you can exclude it by, um, administrators. So, so administrators can run those, those programs regardless of where they live or basic user can run them only in those directories that you define. Um, but you know, we, t when I did it, I tested, uh, Java, uh, through, uh, social engineering toolkit and it was able to stop that attack. Although, like I said, Dave pointed out that you could easily write a little Python script to find other directories where it's executable. Um, I was I tested uh, a PDF, although I, I used an old version of um, Adobe Acrobat. The new ones with uh, sandboxing actually stopped the, the basic set attacks anyway. And then um, I did uh, an attack with a USB rubber ducky that I that I got from Hack Five, which is just a human interface device. I put a little um, uh, a little uh, malware on that, plugged it in. It, it didn't allow it to run either, which was which was really really cool. Uh, so, you know, SRP, you know, and, and John mentioned it the other day on his, uh, SANS webcast was it's, it's really basic and it's, it's kind of like low cost to entry because you're just defining a giant directory for it to run in instead of like app locker where you're defining individual applications. Uh, so it, it seems to be kind of a really easy way to, to, uh, you know, define a line between, um, between really locked down with app locker where only specific applications can run in this kind of uh, you know world where you just blanket it a little bit. Um, I don't know. You got any, any questions? That's kind of a, you know, the rundown of it. It's, it's pretty simple. It's all done through group policy. Um, when I tested, I just added my machine to a, to a lockdown group and pushed the group policy to it. And then it just, just worked. Sweet. So if you use this at your work, did people complain that suddenly they can't use all of their applications that they're relying on? So, yeah, that would that would definitely happen. Uh, I know I didn't really test it in, the, in a live environment at work because I would have had people just absolutely yelling at me. Um, because, you know, everybody's been kind of trained that they can, you know, run anything anywhere, uh, you know, and... and uh, so yeah, it would it would have an impact. We've done we've done similar things where I work um, with excluding jars from running in certain locations or excluding jars from from running from untrusted zones. And when a you know specific ones come to the user's profile directory, they had to kind of move them to a different directory to get them to run. So there would be yeah, I mean there would be some problem there. And you would ha there is a, a logging feature if you turn on SRP but allow it completely unrestricted access, it will actually log. Um, execution attempts in your Windows event log, so you could kind of see where people are running things and and um, and get a sense of you know how much impact it's going to be to your organization. Uh, it definitely big old organizations where there's a lot of stuff running in a lot of different places is going to be a, f a fairly um, I don't know, kind of expensive thing to implement. But I think when you get into smaller, I, I came from a smaller organization, and this absolutely would have worked because. You know, we had pretty good control over where applications run, where they were installed. Um, we used SCCM very heavily and used it very well. Uh, so it would have been pretty easy, easy to just click this on, and, and we would have stopped probably a fairly good percentage of the issues that we saw. Very cool. Well, Greg, your blog post uh, garnered a lot of attention, not just from Dave Kennedy, but from the security community as a whole. Um, it was uh, very widely publicized, so we thank you for that. Keep up the yeah. great work, and we hope to have you back on the show. Thank you. Uh, for a future technical segment. Excellent. Now get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul.